Are you a clinician looking for resources to help you understand the pathogenesis of COVID-19 and how to best diagnose COVID-19 in your patients? Are you looking for a comprehensive review of the current state of laboratory testing for COVID-19 and better understand and interpret these results? If the answer to these questions is yes, then stay tuned. During the next 45 minutes, we aim to arm you with the necessary information that you need to optimally use clinical laboratory tests at your disposal. To do so, Dr. Gaurav Sharma of the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, Dr. David Willens of the Department of Internal Medicine, and a panel of laboratory experts have created a customized educational offering for the clinicians in our system. Welcome. Our aim is to familiarize practicing clinicians like yourself with the structure and pathophysiology of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and also to understand the strengths and limitations of the laboratory testing methods that we use at Henry Ford. Throughout this presentation, you will meet other pathologists, clinical scientists, and medical technologists who are all working together as a team, making sure that you can deliver patient care on the front lines. As we go through the presentation, we will cover several topics. So feel free to skip to individual sections. Let us now start by going back a year in time. In early December 2019, a pneumonia of unknown cause was detected in Wuhan, China, and was reported to the World Health Organization. Medical teams in Wuhan used different laboratory modalities to identify the causative agent for this atypical pneumonia. On EM studies of airway tissue, the team discovered viruses clinging onto the surface of the airway cells. When molecular sequencing was performed, it was discovered that this virus was a new strain of coronaviruses that had not yet been reported amongst humans. Thus, it was called a novel coronavirus. Coronaviruses are named for the crown-like spikes on their surface. Human coronaviruses were first identified in the mid-1960s, and people around the world commonly got infected with the 229E, NL63, OC43, and HKU1 coronaviruses. However, certain animal coronaviruses that infect can evolve, infect humans, and cause outbreaks including the SARS-CoV, the virus that caused the 2003 SARS outbreak, and MERS-CoV, the virus that caused the 2012 outbreak. The phylogenic analysis of the SARS-CoV-2 genome places it in the subgenus coronavirus of the genus beta coronavirus. With this clawed, SARS-CoV-2 is grouped in a distinct lineage together with four bat coronaviruses as well as two pangolian coronavirus. In the United States, the first case of COVID-19 was confirmed on January 20th, 2020. In Michigan, the first case was confirmed on March 10th, 2020. On March 16th, 2020, our clinical microbiology laboratory was the first laboratory in Michigan to offer clinical testing for COVID-19. Within eight months, our laboratories have now performed over 200,000 COVID-19 PCR tests and over 9,000 COVID-19 serology tests. The SARS-CoV-2 virus is a single-stranded RNA. The genome is around 30 KB in size and it shares about 82% sequence identity with SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV. Most of the genome includes open reading frames, or ORFs, that encode two types of proteins, structural proteins and non-structural proteins. The first ORF encompasses approximately 66% of the whole genome and encodes 16 non-structural proteins, which are mainly involved in the replication of the virus. Other ORFs encode structural proteins, namely A, spike protein, S. It forms the spikes that attach to ACE2 receptors on host cells. Spike glycoprotein plays a significant role in pathogenesis. 
the S protein initiates the infection by sticking the viron to the host. During this process, S protein undergoes conformational changes and releases its RNA. This released viral RNA forms replication complexes inside the infected cells and starts the process of creating additional viruses. The daughter viruses are eventually released by exocytosis and the cycle repeats itself. To understand the clinical implications of the mutations that we are seeing in this virus, uh, we are joined by Dr. Dhananjay Chitale, who is the Vice Chair of Anatomic Pathology and the Division Head of Molecular Genetic Pathology. Welcome, Dr. Chitale. Thank you. Thank you for having me uh, for the CME event. Oh. That the strain that we are now seeing is not the same strain as what, what first emerged from China. Now, this variation is not uncommon since this is an, uh, an RNA virus. You know, any uh, viruses such as SARS-CoV-2, HIV, and influenza tend to pick up mutations quickly as they are copied inside their host. Now, enzymes that copy RNA are prone to making errors. That's the root cause. In the short run, most mutations are either neutral or detrimental to the virus. But in the long run, genetic diversity in SARS-CoV-2 is critical for its fitness, survival, and its pathogenesis. How fast is this mutation rate? Uh, so uh, let's let's show a graphic. So in this graphic, this is a, a graphical representation of the virus. The genomic analysis of the SARS-CoV-2 shows mutations in these various genes uh, uh, as listed here. So it's a it's all across its uh, this virus's genome. Now sequencing data suggests that coronavirus change uh, changes more slowly than most other uh, RNA viruses probably because of a proofreading enzyme that corrects the potentially fatal copying mistakes. A typical SARS-CoV-2 virus accumulates only two single letter mutations per month in its genome. Now, comparatively, a rate of change that is about half that of influenza and one quarter that of HIV. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Using genetic sequencing, um, are we able to track the spread of this virus? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, we can track different strains. Uh, in fact, uh, currently we have an IRB approved ongoing next generation sequencing project exactly aimed at studying the, uh, the question that you asked. What is the D614G mutation that uh, everyone is talking about? And how is it important clinically? Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a great question. So uh, here is another uh, graphic to show what uh, I'm going to describe next. At the 614th amino acid position of the spike protein, the amino acid aspirated uh, D uh, in the biochemical shorthand is being replaced by glycine. That's another uh, amino acid uh, with letter capital G because of a copying, D, uh, copying fault. Now we call this uh, the D614G mutation. Now interestingly, compared to the original strain, people infected with this new strain have higher viral loads in their nose and throat, though they don't seem to get any sicker. So they're kind of asymptomatic carriers. They're uh, also much more contagious to others. And the new strain uh, has a change uh, to its spike protein and makes it much more efficient in its ability to bind human cells. Thank you so much for this information. Thank you, Gaurav, for having me. Before we go into any discussion about interpreting COVID-19 test results, we should understand the validity of any laboratory results. In order to make a diagnosis in a particular patient, how do the test's sensitivity and specificity help? Let's go back to why we need testing to begin with. So in medicine, uh, we need tests, either lab tests or radiology tests, in order to separate individuals who are in front of us into two groups, the diseased versus the non-diseased. Usually, there is a normal distribution within each condition and an area of overlap between the two conditions. Often a 
arbitrary cutoff is used to demarcate diseased versus non-diseased cohorts. For example, a cutoff of 6.5 or greater is used when we are testing people for hemoglobin A1c. Where you choose to put that cutoff determines the test validity. If the test is able, if that cutoff is able to classify a large proportion of diseased and non-diseased correctly, it is said to have a cutoff that gives high validity. And this has two components to it, sensitivity and specificity. And we are trying to balance both of them. The, the, these two are the fundamental characteristics of the test itself. When we are developing a new method, we have to compare it to a pre-existing method, which is often called the gold standard. The gold standard can be based on a pre-existing lab test, a clinical criteria, a clinical outcome, or a combination. Let us say we perform a validation study, and we know that in a population of 100, 10 people have the condition by a prior gold standard, and the rest, which is 90, do not have the condition. So the prevalence of the disease itself is around 10%. Now let's take our new test and perform it on the same population. Nine out of 10 diseased people test positive with the new method, and one is missed. Also, among 90 healthy people, 80 were cl correctly classified with a negative result, and 10 were incorrectly classified with a positive result. So, so what is sensitivity? Sensitivity is the proportion of diseased individuals who will test positive. It is expressed as true positives divided by the sum of true positives plus false negatives. In this case, it is nine divided by 10. So that is 90%. Please note, tests with high sensitivity help us in ruling out a, di a disease. Remember the acronym SNOUT, sensitive, out. Specificity, on the other hand, is the proportion of healthy individuals who will test negative. It is expressed as true negative divided by true negative plus false positive. In this case, it is 80 divided by 90 or 89%. Now, please remember, tests with high specificity help us in ruling in a disease. Remember the acronym SPIN, specificity, helps you rule in a disease. So Dr. Sharma, I thought that a test with high sensitivity and high specificity was good enough. What else do we need to know to accurately make a diagnosis in a given patient? Positive predictive value and negative predictive value, depending upon whether you got a positive or a negative result. So what is PPV? Uh, if we go back to our uh, table, uh, PPV is the probability of having the disease given that the test is positive. On the other hand, NPV is the probability of not having the disease given that the test is negative. Now, PPV in our example, it is 47%. Negative predictive value defined as true negative divided by true negative plus false negative gives us an NPV of 98%. And this is the formula that can help you calculate PPV and NPV if you know the sensitivity and specificity of the assay and the current prevalence of the disease. Now, looking at the formula, it's quite clear that PPV is directly proportional to prevalence. Therefore, as the prevalence goes up, PPV goes up. Therefore, care must be taken in interpreting any test for 
the viral infection, particularly when the prevalence is too low. On the other hand, if the clinical suspicion is high and the patient is symptomatic, then infection should not be ruled out on the basis of a negative result alone. So the sensitivity and specificity tell me about the performance of the test and the positive and negative predictive values tell me if I can act on a positive or negative result in a particular patient. What other factors should I keep in mind for diagnosing COVID-19? The first factor is the timing of the test itself. And the RT-PCR test will be negative in the earliest part of the condition, will become positive and will become negative. So if you have tested too early or you have tested too late, you might get a result that does not match the clinical condition. The other thing to think about is the site of sampling. We know with this disease, sometimes the virus is quite enriched in the area that was sampled, which is usually the upper airways, and sometimes it is not. What is important because of these two factors is that a laboratory test should not be used as the sole criteria for ruling in or ruling out disease. Molecular methods are the gold standard for diagnosing suspected cases of COVID-19. The reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction or RT-PCR is a very sensitive test method for detecting the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Our RT-PCR assay uses multiple targets for the virus. However, interpreting an RT-PCR can have its limitation. Therefore, joining us now is Dr. Lineot Samuel, Division Head of Clinical Microbiology. Welcome, Dr. Samuel. Thank you, Dr. Samuel. Is the RT-PCR test positive throughout the course of the disease? So, typically the uh, PCR uh, test becomes positive in infected patients uh, about a day before symptom onset. And these patients typically exhibit the highest viral load uh, about a day or so after, uh, at, the day, at the time of symptom onset, and then for several days after, typically about five to seven days after symptom onset. During this period, we expect the patients to be PCR positive and we see excellent performance uh, when using the PCR. Now, let me be quick to clarify, these assays are exclusively sensitive and they can detect very low levels of viral RNA. What the, the challenge is in these patients though is if they show up too late after symptom onset, the amount of viral RNA in their specimen is extremely low and will not be detected. For that reason, it is important not to rule out COVID based on a single negative COVID PCR in patients who have signs and symptoms of COVID. On the other hand, we do have some patients who stay persistently positive for long periods of time and continue to shed viral RNA in their samples, in some cases for months. But once symptom onset has started, um, ideally you would test the patient within a week of symptom onset. But obviously that's not always within our power to control. So you test the patient as they come in, but consider that if they're negative, but they have signs and symptoms of COVID, and you need to establish the diagnosis, then you can try alternative specimen types. In some cases, the virus is no longer present in the upper respiratory tract, and you might want to test a sputum or, or a tracheal aspirate sample to see if it's present in the lower respiratory tract. We've had a number of patients who had no detectable virus in their nasopharyngeal or nasal swabs, but had extremely high levels of virus in their sputum samples. What is the sensitivity and specificity profile of the different kinds of RT-PCRs that we are using in our laboratories? So as I mentioned before, the different we have multiple platforms in our lab and we've, we've uh, evaluated all of them independently and they all have excellent performance. The specificity, all of them use dual targets, so two different gene tar targets. And so they have excellent specificity. As far as sensitivity, again, that depends on the timing of specimen collection, the quality of specimen collection. So a lot of variables come into play. I would say that with a well-collected mm -hmm. specimen during the optimal time frame, you should see 90% plus sensitivity 
with these RT-PCRs. Unfortunately, we often don't always get all those things lined up, which is why you may occasionally see false negative PCRs. Uh, what do we need to understand about the limitations of using cycle thresholds and what is the future potential of using them? So this is a really important point, Dr. Sharma. The cycle threshold, there are, unfortunately, there are no clear uh, guidelines or uh, from the FDA on how to use cycle threshold. Not only that, the none of the ISs we, we use are approved for release of their cycle threshold values in the clinical settings. Uh, what's also even more con convoluted is that each uh, instrument has different uses, different cycle threshold values. So you could take the same sample, test it across five different platforms from different vendors and get different cycle threshold values. So it's important to understand that it's very challenging to interpret cycle threshold values. But it is true that generally speaking, the CT value or cycle threshold value is inversely correlated with the amount of viral RNA in your sample. So the lower the value of CT, the higher the amount of viral RNA present in the patient sample. So that can sometimes be used to extrapolate whether or not the patient is infectious. Uh, we don't routinely do this unless we, we feel that it can be used to significantly impact patient management in a emergent surgery or transplant setting. Now, can CT values be compared if the testing was performed at different laboratories using different instruments? No, so they cannot be compared between laboratories and within each laboratory, they cannot be compared between instruments. You actually have to look at each instrument separately because they all use different technologies and different methodologies to generate the CT values. So you would get different CT values from the same patient, the same sample, depending on which platform you're running it on. It's also important to note that you can get different CT values from the same patient when collecting multiple samples, depending on the time of the sample collection and the quality of the sample that you collected. So there are really a lot of caution. We are very hesitant to use CT values unless absolutely necessary, but it does have utility in certain settings. Okay. Now, moving on to uh, specimen collection, uh, what are the different types of specimens that can be collected and what are their strengths and weaknesses? Mm -hmm. So obviously the, the preferred specimen is an endopharyngeal swab. The challenges of course are the need for uh, resources for specimen collection, personnel for specimen collection, the risk to the individuals within the collection, and the discomfort to the patient as well. So the FDA has come out and said that they consider nasal swabs to have acceptable performance when compared to nasopharyngeal swabs. Uh, so we typically recommend nasopharyngeal swabs for asymptomatic patients for screening and nasal swabs for symptomatic, but really uh, we do accept uh, either of them in, in both settings. Um, aside from that, uh, in patients who uh, might be falsely negative and have signs and symptoms of COVID when using the nasal or nasopharyngeal swabs, you can do sputum or tracheal aspirates uh, for testing as well. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, saliva-based testing? How has that worked out within our laboratories? Yeah, so that's an important point, Dr. Sharma. Saliva-based testing has gotten a lot of popularity because of the ease of collection and also because uh, it can be self-collected by the patient without the need for medical personnel to assist in the collection process. Uh, the challenge is that in our hands, we have seen that saliva does not perform as well as nasal or nasopharyngeal swabs in terms of sensitivity for detection of the COVID virus. Uh, and so uh, while we don't currently offer saliva testing, it's, it's quite likely we will offer saliva testing in the future. I would still limit its use to very low risk uh, settings where the likelihood of harm from a false, false negative result is limited. So in, uh, com you know, in, in schools, colleges, or, or a large population that need to be screened and where, the, where your, um, restraint, your restrictions are on the resources of the collection sample, that's where saliva may play a role. What are your thoughts about the kits that had come up in the early part of the pandemic? Um, point of care kits that promised uh, quick results. Yeah, so it's been clear for a long time that we cannot test everyone that wants to be tested with PCR alone. The supply chain has been extremely strained by the lack of resources. And that's one of the reasons why we're running even time four to six different platforms in the laboratory just to keep up with COVID testing. Um, and, and so the antigen and point of care test kits do 
play a role in making testing more accessible, but they do come with a lot of limitations. They are definitely nowhere near as sensitive as the PCR-based test. Um, and so you can get variations in performance from, any, from anywhere from 50% sensitivity to 80% sensitivity. So you could be missing a significant number of, uh, of uh, positive results. On the other hand, there have been reports also of specificity issues and false positive results with antigen test kit. So you want to take caution um, in, in using those test kits um, and, and interpreting the results. Recently, our laboratories started to offer combined flu and COVID-19 testing. Uh, what are the plans with that? So we currently offer um, flu and COVID testing, these are separate orders, but they can be done on the same sample. Uh, and once flu comes into the community, we will have a combined flu COVID order. That's not available just yet. So this combined test, uh, these, these two tests, uh, testing the order in the same sample. And if you're in the urgent care setting or in the emergency department, that testing is happening on location for the hospitals and for the four large urgent care sites, Brownstown, Fairlane, Sterling Heights, and Cottage. And this allows uh, patient care and management to happen in real time to facilitate testing on location. This is being performed in the stat labs uh, at those locations. And it's being performed with PCR based platforms that offer you sensitivity and specificity that's comparable to the platforms that we are using in core microbiology laboratory. Uh, what would be your closing thoughts, like a summary statement for anybody who wishes to use the RT PCR test? I think it's important to consider, um, you know, the timing of testing relative to exposure, making sure that the patient's not tested too soon post exposure, uh, making sure that you collect the optimal sample, whether it's a nasopharyngeal swab or a nasal swab, there is a prescribed technique and you can go online to the lab user's guide and, and, and get details on that technique, making sure that you're using the approved transport media and uh, for, for submitting the specimen. And, and also counseling the patient on how to interpret the test results and, and how to interpret even a negative result. If clinicians have questions about a test result or they have uh, questions about the methodology, who should they reach out? So they can reach out to myself or you know, Dr. Robert Tibbetts, our Associate Director, and we'd be happy to speak to them or walk them through discussions on any uh, test results. Can they also reach out to the Lab Customer Center? Yes, they can contact Lab Customer Service. So uh, I should qualify that that uh, thing. If they have specific questions about the uh, availability of results or methodology or specimen collection, then absolutely contact Lab Customer Services. Uh, otherwise, if it's about interpretation of a of a test result where you see something unusual, then reach out to myself or Dr. Chips. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you, Dr. Sherman. On June 3rd, 2020, the Core Automated Laboratory at Main Campus began testing for antibodies for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Serological assays determine the exposure history and or immune status of a patient. To help understand the medical significance of serological testing, we are joined by Dr. John Carey, Vice Chair of Clinical Pathology, and Dr. Bernard Cook, Division Head of Clinical Chemistry. Dr. Kerry, welcome. Uh, could you please help us understand the pattern of immunological response seen in COVID-19? After the initial viral infection, there is a delay before the immune system produces detectable antibodies. During this time, which is known as the window period, a patient who is infected with SARS-CoV-2 would most likely have a negative test result on a serologic assay. Typically, when the immune system mounts a response against the virus, the short-lived immunoglobulin M or IgM antibodies are initially produced, shortly followed by a more durable IgG antibody response. Should serology testing be used for initial diagnostic workup of patients? No. For the initial diagnostic workup of a symptomatic patient, a PCR test and not uh, an antibody test should be used. The antibody test is best used for diagnostic purposes after 14 days of symptom onset 
or exposure to someone with COVID-19. Positive antibody result indicates, but does not guarantee, that the individual has been exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Also, a positive antibody result cannot be used as an immunity certificate, as it has not been conclusively determined how long COVID-19 antibodies may persist or how protective or neutralizing they really are. A negative antibody result implies that the antibody assay did not detect the presence of the IgG antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. A small set, subset of people infected with the virus never produce antibodies. Now, can we see false negatives in serology testing? Absolutely. Uh, a false negative result may be seen if the test is used within 14 days of symptom onset or exposure to someone with COVID-19. This false negative result is due to an inadequate amount of time elapsing since symptom onset or exposure for the patient to have produced detectable antibodies. A false negative result can also be present in an immunocompromised individual. Uh, what about false positives in serology testing? A false positive result may be seen in individuals who have an infection with other coronaviruses, such as the viruses causing the common cold. Given the specificity of our assays, false positives are very unlikely. Approximately one in 500 patients without SARS-CoV-2 infection will be positive. So, Dr. Cook, could you help us understand the serology assay that is being used in our laboratory now? Yes. The, the test that we offer in the core laboratory determines whether or not there are IgG antibodies in the blood. These antibodies recognize the receptor binding domain of the spike 1 protein of SARS-CoV-2 and have a sensitivity of 99.1% and a specificity of 99.8%. We chose an IgG assay, which is typically a more specific assay, instead of an IgM assay, which is usually a more sensitive early marker, but less specific. In fact, many experts have been surprised that IgG antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 have become detectable at about the same time as IgM antibodies. Mm -hmm. you know, this test is a qualitative test. So results are reported as reactive or positive, indeterminate, or non-reactive, negative, for, for antibodies. An indeterminate result means that the test does not detect a clearly positive signal for uh, the antibodies. This is due to too little time elapsing between viral exposure and blood sampling. This is important because in this instance, the physician should consider repeat testing in seven to 10 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, what has been our experience with serology testing since we started offering it within the system? In our validation study and the subsequent clinical testing, we've showed that by day 14 after symptom onset, over 99% of our patients have a detectable IgG antibody. Over the last four months, we've performed almost 10,000 IgG serology tests, and we've seen a gradual rise in the positivity rate. This trend probably reflects the fact that individuals in our area are getting exposed to the virus and continue to mount a serologic response to the virus. Mm -hmm. uh, coming back to you, Dr. Kerry, uh, what are your thoughts about antigen testing? Well, antigen tests are immunoassays that detect the presence of a specific viral protein or antigen, and its presence or detectability implies current viral infection. Antigen tests for the SARS-CoV-2 are generally less sensitive. According to the CDC, uh, there are currently only limited data to guide the use of a rapid antigen tests for either screening or determine determining infectivity. Uh, this situation is continuously evolving and we would expect this to change in the months to come. The gold standard for clinical diagnostic detection of SARS-CoV-2 remains RT-PCR. 
Um, the sensitivity of the rapid antigen test is generally lower than RT-PCR text. When confirming an antigen test result with RT-PCR, it is important that the time interval between collection of samples for the two tests is less than two days. And there has not been in the interim any opportunities for new exposures. I feel that these tests are most suitable for regular or repeat screening of low risk, asymptomatic, or at most vigils in sports, schools, businesses, and the community in general. So what are our plans for offering antigen testing in the system? We, we plan to offer as soon as they're available from major vendors. We're working with two of our vendors of high throughput antigen testing to bring this to our core laboratory at main campus. Our automated instrument line there will be able to report thousands of antigen tests each day. Thank you, Dr. Kerry. Thank you, Dr. Cook. I appreciate your time and your insights. Joining us now is uh, Ms. Jennifer Siegel, who is the Supervisor of Laboratory Customer Center at Maine Campus. Welcome, Ms. Siegel. Hello. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, the LCS? Laboratory Customer Service is located at Maine Campus in Detroit. We are staffed 24-7 and we have a medical technologist as well as lab service representatives there to take your call whenever you have any questions for the laboratory. So if clinicians are looking for information about how to order tests, uh, especially COVID-19 tests, uh, where can they find that information? If they or the clinic staff need any specific information from the lab, they can contact Laboratory Customer Service at 313-916-LABS or visit our departmental page and Laboratory User's Guide located on 1 Henry. And if you have any or non-urgent questions, please feel free to reach out to us at Laboratory Customer Service at hfhs.org. And in case they are uh, looking for test results, uh, what would be the best way to go about it? Well, we aim to resolve our tests as soon as possible. Please do not call the microbiology laboratory for COVID-19 results, as doing so would interrupt our testing workflow for all of our patients. If you have questions regarding pending results, those should be directed to lab customer service when the sample has been collected for over 24 hours. If the patient was collected at one of our tent sites, Please wait 48 hours from time of collection before calling lab customer service with your questions. Thank you, Ms. Siegel. This information is appreciated. Thank you. Let us now meet two individuals who have been instrumental in leading the laboratory during these unprecedented times. Dr. Richard Zarbo, System Chairman of Pathology, and Mr. John Waugh, System Vice President of Pathology. Dr. Zarbo, what has been your experience in the last eight months? And what have been your priorities? Well, thank you for that question, Gaurav. It's been a whirlwind. Uh, since late February, our number one priority was to develop and validate new COVID tests, as well as to secure the very limited supply chain to provide this testing in an uninterrupted fashion for our clinicians across the entire health system. Our only other option at that time was to send these tests out to the national laboratories and those turnaround times were well over a week, so that was not very functional. In my memory, we have never accomplished so much in such a short period of time. We founded a multidisciplinary lab team that met twice a day for months to accomplish over 70 innovations within the first weeks and this enabled us to start in-house testing as the first laboratory in Michigan to offer hospital-based COVID-19 PCR testing. This team, by the way, continues to meet twice a week as the pace of change continues. We have continued to expand our capability from 100 tests a day back then to over 2,500 tests today. We use seven different methods and now 52 different platforms. Our PCR capability was followed by antibody testing that we offered in early June, and this is to be followed by antigen testing in early January of this year. 
Well, you need to understand that each testing methodology has its advantages and disadvantages. When introducing a test into clinical practice, the laboratory must account for many factors in addition to test performance as assessed by sensitivity and specificity that you heard about earlier. One of the most pressing is test turnaround time to meet the customer requirements. And this is influenced by many things such as timing of collections, transport and specimen arrival, sizes of the collection batches, specimen accession and preparation time, all these pre-analytic variables, and the ability internally to perform multiple tests at the same time on a platform called throughput, and the need to fill a number of specimens on a certain run called batching in order to maintain efficiency within the operation. Mr. Law, from a regulatory human resources and operations perspective, what has been our experience as we bring these new tests into the system? Well, Dr. Sharma, we've ensured that our clinical laboratories offer cutting edge tests that meet or exceed regulatory requirements, including the requirements that are set forth in the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act or CLIA 88. And I want to share with our clinicians that a vast majority of COVID-19 tests in the United States have been introduced under the Emergency Use Authorization or EUA program of the Food and Drug Administration. Coming back to you, Dr. Zarbo, uh, how do we measure our process? How do we know things are working or not working during the course of a day, a week, or a month? Well, our main aim is to provide accurate results as quickly as possible to you. And we have done that consistently within 24 hours, even for outpatient and employee collections. Our priority testing is performed within one to four hours for select populations like emergent surgery, labor and delivery, symptomatic ED patients, and hospital admissions, so that these rapid test results are actionable in a meaningful time frame. Each morning, we also review from our information systems critical pieces of information, such as the test positivity rate by select populations at each hospital, and we graph seven-day moving target averages and assemble them into a comprehensive daily report that goes out to our system's physician leadership. This essentially is our version of the USA Today, so grab a cup of coffee and join us someday. This report also provides detailed information of current test volumes, turnaround times for these groups, and curated cohort-specific positivity rates by site. If you wish to receive this report, I would encourage you to reach out to your departmental leaders and let them uh, know so we can include you. Mr. Wall, do you have any message for our physicians and our team members? Dr. Sharma, I just want to pass along uh, my appreciation to the uh, frontline caregivers, uh, the physicians, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, and all others that are there and the trust that they place in, in us uh, in providing information so they can manage better. And Dr. Zarbo, uh, what is your message for our physicians and team members? And allow me to convey our special appreciation for all that you do on the front lines during this challenging pandemic. I know it's been very difficult. We in the laboratory are deeply appreciative of your collaboration with us and your expertise in taking care of our patients and it has truly been our pleasure to serve you during this opportunity. We did not cover who to test and where to send your patients because that information may change in the course of the pandemic and is usually decided at the level of the system. We recommend you to contact your practice leaders for the most updated information. This is a summary table that encapsulates all the information regarding RT-PCR testing, antigen testing, and serology testing. RT-PCR tests are the preferred initial diagnostic test for COVID-19. RT-PCRs are highly specific, but the clinical sensitivity of these tests likely depends on the type and quality of the specimen obtained, the duration of the illness at the time of testing, in certain situations, testing lower respiratory tract specimens, especially for patients who are in the hospital with evidence of lower respiratory tract illness, may help identify the virus. Antigen testing offers an alternative to RT-PCR testing, but is not yet widely available in the system. 
It has comparable specificity with RT-PCR testing, but the sensitivity is known to be lower than RT-PCR. Serological tests detect antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 in the blood and can help identify patients who previously had COVID-19. Detectable antibodies generally take several days to weeks to develop. Thus, serological tests have less utility for diagnosis in the acute setting. Serological tests should be used with caution because of potential for low positive predictive value in the setting of low seroprevalence. We thank you for your time and we hope that this presentation helped you understand the strengths and weaknesses of the laboratory methods. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.